The Battle of Nanking or Battle of Nanjing was fought in early December 1937 during the Second Sino-Japanese War between the National Revolutionary Army of China and the Imperial Japanese Army for control of Nanking, the capital of the Republic of China. Following the outbreak of war between Japan and China in July 1937 the Japanese government at first attempting to contain the fighting and sought a negotiated settlement to the war. However, after victory in the Battle of Shanghai expansionists prevailed within the Japanese military and on December 1 a campaign to capture Nanking was officially authorized. The task of occupying Nanking was given to General Iwan Matsui, the commander of Japan's Central China Area Army, who believed that the capture of Nanking would force China to surrender and thus end the war. Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek ultimately decided to defend the city and appointed Tang Shengji to command the Nanking Garrison Force. A hastily assembled army of local conscripts and the remnants of the Chinese units who had fought in Shanghai. Japanese soldiers marched from Shanghai to Nanking at a breakneck pace, rapidly defeating pockets of Chinese resistance. By December 9 they had reached the last line of defense, the Fukuo Line, behind which lay Nanking's fortified walls. On December 10, Matsui ordered an all-out attack on Nanking, and after less than two days of intense fighting Chiang decided to abandon the city. Before fleeing, Tang ordered his men to launch a concerted break out of the Japanese siege, but by this time Nanking was largely surrounded and its defenses were at the breaking point. Most of Tang's units simply collapsed their soldiers often casting off their weapons and uniforms in the streets in their hopes of hiding among the city's civilian population. Following the capture of the city Japanese soldiers massacred Chinese prisoners of war, murdered civilians, and committed acts of looting and rape in an event known as the Nanking Massacre. Though Japan's military victory excited and emboldened them, the subsequent massacre tarnished their reputation in the eyes of the world. Contrary to Matsui's expectations, China did not surrender and the Second Sino-Japanese War continued for another eight years. Prelude to the battle, Japan's decision to capture Nanking the conflict which would become known as Second Sino-Japanese War started on July 7, 1937 with the skirmish at Marco Polo Bridge which escalated rapidly into a full-scale war in northern China between the armies of China and Japan. China, however, wanted to avoid a decisive confrontation in the north and so instead opened a second front by attacking Japanese units in Shanghai in central China. The Japanese responded by dispatching the Shanghai Expeditionary Army, commanded by General Iwan Matsui, to drive the Chinese army from Shanghai. Intense fighting in Shanghai forced Japan's army general staff, which was in charge of military operations, to repeatedly reinforce the sea. And finally on November 9 an entirely new army, the 10th Army commanded by Lieutenant General Heisuke Angawa, was also landed at Hangzhou Bay just south of Shanghai. Although the arrival of the 10th Army succeeded at forcing the Chinese Army to retreat from Shanghai, the Japanese Army General Staff had decided to adopt a policy of non-expansion of hostilities with the aim of ending the war. On November 7 its de facto leader Deputy Chief of Staff Hayao Tada laid down an operation restriction line, preventing its forces from leaving the vicinity of Shanghai, or more specifically from going west of the Chinese sites of Suzhou and Jiaxing. The city of Nanking is 300 kilometers west of Shanghai. However, a major rift of opinion existed between the Japanese government and its two field armies, the Sea and Tenth Army which as of November were both nominally under the control of the Central China Area Army led by Sea Commander Matsui. Matsui made clear to his superiors even before he left for Shanghai that he wanted to march on Nanking. 
He was convinced that the conquest of the Chinese capital city of Nanking would provoke the fall of the entire nationalist government of China and thus hand Japan a quick and complete victory in its war on China. Yang Gama was likewise eager to conquer Nanking and both men chafed under the Operation Restriction Line that had been imposed on them by the army. General Staff. On November 19, Yang Gawa ordered his 10th Army to pursue retreating Chinese forces across the Operation Restriction Line to Nanking, a flagrant act of insubordination. When Tada discovered this the next day, he ordered Yang Gawa to stop immediately, but was ignored. Matsui made some effort to restrain Yang Gawa, but also told him that he could send some advance units beyond the line. In fact, Matsui was highly sympathetic with Yanagawa's actions and a few days later on November 22 Matsui issued an urgent telegram to the Army General Staff, insisting that, to resolve this crisis in a prompt manner we need to take advantage of the enemy's present declining fortunes and conquer Nanking. By staying behind the Operation Restriction Line at this point we are not only letting our chance to advance slip by, but it is also having the effect of encouraging the enemy to replenish their fighting strength and recover their fighting spirit and there is a risk that it will become harder to completely break their will to make war. Meanwhile, as more and more Japanese units continued to slip past the Operation Restriction Line, Tada was also coming under pressure from within the Army General Staff. Many of Tada's colleagues and subordinates, including the powerful Chief of the General Staff Operations Division Sadamu Shimomura, had come around to Matsui's viewpoint and wanted Tada to approve an attack on Nanking. On November 24, Tada finally relented and abolished the Operation Restriction Line, owing to circumstances beyond our control. And then several days later he reluctantly approved the operation to capture Nanking. Tada flew to Shanghai in person on December 1 to deliver the order though by then his own armies in the field were already well on their way to Nanking. China's decision to defend Nanking on November 15, near the end of the Battle of Shanghai, Chiang Kai-shek convened a meeting of the Military Affairs Commission's Supreme National Defense Council to undertake strategic planning, including a decision on what to do in case of a Japanese attack on Nanking. Here Chiang insisted fervently on mounting a sustained defense of Nanking. Chiang argued, just as he had during the Battle of Shanghai, that China would be more likely to receive aid from the great powers, possibly at the ongoing Nine Power Treaty Conference, if it could prove on the battlefield its will and capacity to resist the Japanese. He also noted that holding on to Nanking would strengthen China's hand in peace talks which he wanted the German ambassador Oskar Trautmann to mediate. Chiang ran into stiff opposition from his officers, including the powerful chief of staff of the Military Affairs Commission He Yingche, the deputy chief of staff Bai Chongxi, the head of the Fifth War's own Li Zongren, and his German advisor Alexander von Falkenhausen. They argued that the Chinese army needed more time to recover from its losses at Shanghai, and pointed out that Nanking was highly indefensible topographically. The mostly gently sloping terrain in front of Nanking would make it easy for the attackers to advance on the city, while the Yangtze River behind Nanking would cut off the defenders' retreat. Chiang, however, had become increasingly agitated over the course of the Battle of Shanghai, even angrily declaring that he would stay behind in Nanking alone and command its defense personally. But just when Chiang believed himself completely isolated, General Tang Shengji, an ambitious senior member of the Military Affairs Commission, spoke out in defense of Chiang's position, although accounts vary on whether Tang vociferously jumped to Chiang's aid or only reluctantly did so. Seizing the opportunity Tang had given him, Chiang responded by organizing the Nanking Garrison Force on November 20 and officially making Tang its commander on November 25. The orders Tang received from Chiang on November 30 were to defend the established defense lines at any cost and destroy the enemy's besieging force. 
though both men publicly declared that they would defend Nanking to the last man, they were aware of their precarious situation. On the same day that the garrison force was established, Chiang officially moved the capital of China from Nanking to Chongqing deep in China's interior. Further, both Chiang and Tang would at times give contradictory instructions to their subordinates on whether their mission was to defend Nanking to the death or merely delay the Japanese advance. The road to Nanking, China's defense preparations on November 20, the Chinese army and teams of conscripted laborers began to hurriedly bolster Nanking's defenses both inside and outside the city. Nanking itself was surrounded by formidable stone walls stretching almost 50 kilometers around the entire city. The walls, which had been constructed hundreds of years earlier during the Ming Dynasty, rose up to 20 meters in height, were 9 meters thick, and had been studded with machine gun emplacements. By December 6 all the gates into the city had been closed and then barricaded with an additional layer of sandbags and concrete 6 meters thick. Outside the walls a series of semicircular defense lines were constructed in the path of the Japanese advance, most notably an outer one about 16 kilometers from the city and an inner one directly outside the city known as the Fukuo Line, or Multiple Positions Line. The Fukuo Line, a sprawling network of trenches, moats, barbed wire, minefields, gun emplacements, and pillboxes was to be the final defense line outside Nanking's city walls. There were also two key high points of land on the Fukuo line, the peaks of Zijishan to the northeast and the plateau of Yuhuatai to the south, where fortification was especially dense. In order to deny the Japanese invaders any shelter or supplies in this area, Tang adopted a strategy of scorched earth on December 7 ordering all homes and structures in the path of the Japanese within 1 to 2 kilometers of the city to be incinerated, as well as all homes and structures near roadways within 16 kilometers of the city. The defending army, the Nanking Garrison Force, was on paper a formidable army of 13 divisions including three elite German-trained divisions plus the super-elite training brigade. But in reality most of these units had trickled back to Nanking severely mauled from the fighting in Shanghai. By the time they reached Nanking they were physically exhausted, low on equipment, and badly depleted in total troop strength. In order to replenish some of these units, 16,000 young men and teenagers from Nanking and the rural villages surrounding it were speedily pressed into service as new recruits. An additional 14,000 fresh soldiers were brought in from Hankou to fill the ranks of the Second Army. However, due to the unexpected rapidity of the Japanese advance, most of the new conscripts received only rudimentary training on how to fire their guns on their way to or upon their arrival at the front lines. No definitive statistics exist on how many soldiers the Nanking garrison force had managed to cobble together by the time of the battle, but among leading estimates are those of David Askew who says 73,790 to 81,500, those of Ikuhiko Hata who estimates 100,000, and those of Tokushi Kasahara who argues in favor of about 150,000. But during this period Japan's Navy Air Service was launching frequent air raids on the city, eventually totaling 50 raids according to the Navy's own records. The Navy Air Service had struck Nanking for the first time on August 15, and after winning air supremacy over the city on September 19 it began bombing the city night and day with impunity, hitting both military and civilian targets. In the face of Japanese bombs and the ongoing advance of the Japanese army, the large majority of Nanking's citizens fled the city. By early December Nanking's population had dropped from its former total of more than 1 million to less than 500,000, a figure which included Chinese refugees from rural villages burned down by their own government's scorched-earth policies. 
Most of those still in the city were very poor and had nowhere else to go. Foreign residents of Nanking were also repeatedly asked to leave the city which was becoming more and more chaotic under the strain of bombings, fires, looting by criminals, and electrical outages. But those few foreigners brave enough to stay behind strived to find a way to help the Chinese civilians who had been unable to leave. In late November a group of them led by German citizen John Rabe established the Nanking Safety Zone in the center of the city, a self-proclaimed demilitarized zone where civilian refugees could congregate in order to hopefully escape the fighting. The safety zone was recognized by the Chinese government, and on December 8, Tang Shengji demanded that all civilians evacuate there. Among those Chinese who did manage to escape Nanking were Chiang Kai-shek and his wife Sung Mei Ling, who had flown out of Nanking on a private plane just before the crack of dawn on December 7. The mayor of Nanking and most of the municipal government left the same day, entrusting management of the city to the Nanking Garrison Force. Japan's march on Nanking By the start of December Japan's Central China Area Army had swollen in strength to over 160,000 men, though only about 50,000 of these would ultimately participate in the fighting. The plan of attack against Nanking was a pincer movement which the Japanese called encirclement and annihilation. The two prongs of the Central China Area Army's pincer were the Shanghai Expeditionary Army advancing on Nanking from its eastern side and the 10th Army advancing from its southern side. To the north and west of Nanking lay the Yangtze River, but the Japanese planned to plug this possible escape route as well, both by dispatching a squadron of ships up the river and by deploying two special detachments to circle around behind the city. The Kunasaki detachment was to cross the Yangtze in the south with the ultimate aim of occupying Pukou on the river bank west of Nanking while the Yamada detachment was to be sent on the far north route with the ultimate aim of taking Mufushan just north of Nanking. General Matsui, along with the army general staff, envisaged making a slow and steady march on Nanking but his subordinates refused to play along and instead raced eagerly with each other to be the first to get to the city. Soon all units were roaring to Nanking at the breakneck pace of up to 40 km per day. For instance, the 10th Army captured the key town of Guangdu on November 30th three days before it was even supposed to start its planned advance and the sea captured Danyang on December 2nd more than five days ahead of schedule. In order to achieve such speeds, the Japanese soldiers carried little with them except weaponry and ammunition. Because they were marching well ahead of most of their supply lines they had to purchase or loot their food from Chinese civilians along the way. During their advance the Japanese overcame initially light resistance from the already battered Chinese forces who were being pursued by the Japanese. From Shanghai in a running battle, here the Japanese were aided by their complete air supremacy, their abundance of tanks, the improvised and hastily constructed nature of the Chinese defenses and also by the Chinese strategy of concentrating their defending forces on small patches of relatively high ground which made him easy to outflank and surround. On December 5, Chiang Kai-shek paid a visit to a defensive encampment near Jurong to heckle his men to keep up the fight, but he was forced to beat a hasty retreat when the Japanese army burst onto the battlefield guns blazing. On that day the rapidly moving forward contingents of the sea occupied Jurong and then arrived at Chunhua Zhen, a key point of Nanking's outer line of defense which would put Japanese artillery in range of the city. Here China's 51st Division flung its main force into the fighting and repeatedly repulsed Japanese attacks before cracking on December 8 when the main force of the sea arrived. The sea also took the fortress of Zhenjiang and the spa town of Tangshizhen on that day. Meanwhile, on the south side of the same defense line, 
armored vehicles of Japan's 10th Army charged the Chinese position at Jiangjunshan and Nasushan defended by China's 58th Division. Valiant Chinese soldiers armed with hammers jumped onto the vehicles and banged repeatedly on their roofs shouting, Get out of there! But after darkness fell on the battlefield the 58th Division was finally overwhelmed on December 9 after suffering, according to its own records, 800 casualties. By December 9 Japan's forces had reached Nanking's last line of defense, the daunting Fukuo Line. At this point General Matsu had of summons to surrender, drawn up which implored the Chinese to send military envoys to Nanking's Zhongshan Gate to discuss terms for the peaceful occupation of the city. And he then had the Mitsubishi Ki-21 scatter thousands of copies of the message over the city. Later that day Tang proclaimed to his men that our army has entered into the final battle to defend Nanking on the Fukuo line. Each unit shall firmly defend its post with the resolve to either live or die with it. You're not allowed to retreat on your own, causing defense to collapse, the American journalist F. Tillman Durden, who was reporting on site during the battle, saw one small group of Chinese soldiers set up a barricade, assemble in a solemn semicircle, and promise each other that they would die together where they stood.